All right, what the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And today, I'm here to save you from yourself. I'm here to save you from the scourge of bad running back takes. And today, I'm going to talk about J.K. Dobbins versus Travis Etienne in Dynasty and why you should be selecting Travis Etienne over J.K. Dobbins. Let's get into it. <laughs> Currently, Travis Etienne is not being selected ahead of J.K. Dobbins in Dynasty. Per single QB drafts in DLF in March, they don't have startup ADP up there, otherwise I would use it. But in single QB drafts in March per DLF, J.K. Dobbins is currently being taken at the 31st overall pick as the RB15. Travis Etienne is currently being selected with the 44th overall pick as the RB19. Per keep trade cut, which is super flex, J.K. Dobbins, currently the 35th player overall and the RB8. Travis Etienne, currently the 49th player overall and the RB14. So there's between a four and, what is that, a six running back difference between where Dobbins is being taken, where Etienne is being taken. That's over a full round per both DLF and keep trade cut, whether it's super flex, single QB. Travis Etienne is going around later than Dobbins, if not more, right now in Dynasty. And the first thing that I think anybody should do when considering ranking players in Dynasty, considering two players relative to each other in Dynasty, the number one thing you should consider is player talent. And I think that's true because obviously situation matters. We know situation matters, but situation is much more fluid than player talent is, you know, outside the obvious context of like a devastating injury or something like that, that impacts player talent. Age also impacts player talent, but these are similarly aged players. They're both coming off injuries and I'll kind of address the injuries later in the video. But in general, player talent is the most important thing to consider when ranking players in Dynasty. And I think Travis Etienne is just the better player. And we see that, you know, he hasn't played in the NFL that, we see that through the lens of their respective profiles as prospects. And so I'll kind of break those down very briefly here. As producers, they were fairly similar. I think Travis Etienne's career was probably a bit better, but I'll start with Dobbins. As a true freshman, 16% dominator rating, then a 17% dominator rating as a sophomore, then a 28% dominator rating as a junior on really high quality Ohio State teams. He broke out year one as an 18 year old, really solid. Those dominator ratings are in the 63rd, 42nd, and 66th percentiles. So he capped out as like a 66th percentile guy at a really high-end program, had a down year as a sophomore, but overall pretty good. And historical running backs who had similar like career paths to him, given like the dominator ratings he posted, given the seasons he posted them in, given the program he played for, the guys with like similar college careers, Jamal Charles, Lamar Miller, Ronald Jones, Joe Mixon, guys like that. Travis Etienne, as a true freshman, 20% dominator rating, then a 26% dominator rating, then 26% again as a junior, then 25% as a senior. Those are in the 74th, 71st, 60th, and 51st percentiles. So he also broke out year one, really high-end program at Clemson. His production kind of plateaued as he went, like once he, you know, established himself as a sophomore, that's kind of, really he established himself as a, as a freshman, but, you know, kind of once he got to that 25% dominator rating level as a sophomore, he didn't increase from there. He was already a really good player, so it didn't, you know, kind of go up from there. There. But guys with his, you know, kind of similar production profiles, Mark Ingram, Lendell White in those old on those old USC teams, Cedric Benson back in the day for Texas, you know, high end programs, similar production profiles at national championship contending teams, those three guys. So I think Dobbins and ETN are pretty equivalent there. Production is sort of like a, a bird's eye view, like how good is this player? And they're fairly equivalent there. As receivers, uh, we start to see a little bit of discrepancy. Dobbins, his best target share was a 7% mark, which is in the 28th percentile. But he did catch over 70 passes in his career, which is, you know, above average, 70th percentile. And he was used fairly dynamically as a receiver at Ohio State. He was split out wide almost 15% of the time. He was targeted a full yard downfield on average, 67th percentile A dot. He had a quality catch rate on those advanced targets, 85%. And he averaged 7.7 .7 yards per target while averaging only 8.7 yak per reception. So... I like to see high efficiency, but I don't like to see it solely fueled by like these these high yak numbers. I don't want my guy to just not be a great receiver, but have quality receiving numbers because he's big and fast and is just a good runner. 
That doesn't really tell you what he is as a receiver. Dobbins, yak per reception, 32nd percentile, which kind of makes sense. If he's being split out wide, catching the ball further downfield than most running backs are, you don't have as many opportunities for yak, but he's kind of catching a high percentage of his targets, being efficient when the ball's thrown to him. I think he's a good receiver. Travis Etienne. Uh, was more involved as a receiver, not early on. He was one of these guys who, like Ronald Jones, we were like, okay, this dude needs to catch the ball. He's not super big. Like, he needs to be involved in the passing game. As a junior and senior, he, like, blew up in the passing game. He became very good there. And he ended up with an 11% target share, 102 career receptions. Those are both above the 70th percentile. But he wasn't used quite as dynamically as Dobbins was, like, significantly less, actually. He was only split out wide uh, 6% of the time. His A dot is negative 0.4, which is in the 33rd percentile. That's obviously backwards. And he did catch a large percentage of his passes, 87%, but they're fairly low degree of difficulty passes. And he is one of these guys who had high receiving efficiency and very high yak numbers. He averaged 13 yards after the catch per reception. That's a 94th percentile mark. And his yards per target is also in the 90th percentile. So I think the concern early on for ETN was like, can this dude contribute in the passing game at all? And he proved that. I don't know that he's some sort of like downfield advanced receiving weapon. There were reports out of like Jaguars camp when he was a rookie that, you know, Urban Meyer wanted to use him as a wide receiver and stuff like that. So maybe they saw something there that, you know, they thought could be useful in a more dynamic role. But so far, what we've actually seen in what he's done on the field, he's obviously able to catch the football and make things happen after the catch. But I don't know that he's an especially talented, you know, like route run or, you know, being asked to do advanced things as a receiver. So quality receiver for ETN, I think better for Dobbins. As runners, the way I like to evaluate rushing efficiency is by looking at a few like contextual factors. Number one, what was the size of a guy's workload? Number two, I'm going to compare guys' efficiency to that of their teammates, given that they're operating in the same offensive environment. It gives us an idea of like, is this guy rising above kind of like the baseline yardage available? in his offense. So volume, the talent level of his teammates, and the box counts that he's seeing relative to those teammates. And J.K. Dobbins had a pretty large workload, 227 carries per season, 81st percentile. He's, he played with really talented teammates. They averaged 3.92 stars as high school recruits. That's also in the 81st percentile. But he did see slightly lower box counts than they did. Negative 0.03 defenders in the box relative to what his teammates were seeing, which is in the 43rd percentile. And relative to those teammates, on that volume, Given those box counts, he averaged 0.10 yards per carry greater than the other guys in the team during his three years, which is a 32nd percentile mark. Obviously, that's higher than theirs. That's higher than their yard per carry output. But like, how impressive is that? Obviously, it's in the 32nd percentile, so probably not that impressive. And given historical data on, like, what would a guy in this situation do, given the talent level of his teammates, given his volume... A guy in that situation, an NFL quality back, would be expected to average 0.28 yards per carry greater than his teammates. So yes, Dobbins had high volume. Yes, Dobbins played with talented teammates, but other guys in that situation, we would expect him to average almost three times better yard per carry plus than Dobbins did. So kind of underdoing expectations there for our guy. And given the box counts that he saw, I developed a metric called box adjusted efficiency rating, which looks at player efficiency at each box count, you know, five man boxes, six man boxes, etc., relative to what his teammates are doing there. And then using a weighted average produces like a percentage number that tells us overall, given the box counts, like how efficient is this guy relative to his teammates? 100% would be exactly what his teammates are doing. Anything above would be he's outdoing them. Anything below 100% would be he's slightly being outperformed by them to whatever degree. Dobbins' box-adjusted efficiency rating in college was 99.5%, so he was slightly less efficient overall. That's an 18th percentile number, so not great. There's another metric that I developed called relative success rate, which doesn't look at an average. It looks at the rate at which you're gaining a requisite amount of yards given down a distance, also adjusted for box counts in the same way that box-adjusted efficiency rating is. So it's a measure of consistency, basically. And Dobbins' relative success rate was 0.2% higher than his teammates, which which is also in the 38th percentile. So below average efficiency overall, below average consistency relative to his teammates, not great. Kind of ancillary metrics, like what is he doing, kind of like isolated to his own performance. Missed tackles forced per attempt per PFF in the 37th percentile. 
breakaway conversion rate, how often is he turning his 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs, so just kind of isolating it to what is he doing in the open field, 35%, 71st percentile. So he's a quality open field runner. He's a big play guy. He's not breaking tackles. He's not consistent relative to his teammates. And despite being a big play guy, he's not efficient overall relative to his teammates. And kind of given those metrics, like guys, historical players with similar um, kind of efficiency metrics at a similar size to Dobbins, he's 5'9 and a half, 209, didn't test at the combine. So we're not sure what his athletic profile looks like, but like Ray Rice is a good example, but also guys like Bishop Sankey, Wayne Gallman, you know, kind of a mixed bag there from a rushing efficiency standpoint. For ETN, things are a lot better. He had a lower workload, 172 carries per 12 games, just 46th percentile. And he played with talented teammates, but slightly less talented than Dobbins. 3.37 stars as high school recruits. That's in the 58th percentile for those guys. And he saw heavier box counts than his teammates did. 0.22 relative box count. 87th percentile. So dudes against Clemson were stacking the box against ETN more than they were against other running backs, unlike Dobbins at Ohio State. And given that volume, given those teammates, we would expect an NFL quality running back in Travis Etienne's situation to average 0.41 yards per carry greater than his teammates. Travis Etienne, in reality, averaged 1.42 yards per carry greater than his teammates. So a full yard above what we would even expect from an NFL quality running back in the same situation. Travis Etienne was really good in college. His box adjusted efficiency rating, 126%. His relative success rate, 5% higher than his teammates. Those are both above the 72nd percentile. And ancillary metrics, kind of like isolating it to what he's doing on the field. 0.32 missed tackles forced per attempt. I think we kind of think of Etienne as just this like straight line speed guy who gets hit and goes down. Not the case. That's a 97th percentile like tackle breaking performance and breakaway conversion rate, even better than Dobbins. 90th percentile, he's converting 41% of his 10 yard runs into 20 yard runs. He's incredible in the open field. He's an incredible tackle breaker and he was very efficient and very consistent relative to quality teammates and kind of backs from the past with similar metrics, with similar metrics at like a similar size. He's 5'10", 215, he ran a 4'5 at the combine, burst score in the 64th percentile. Similar guys at like height, weight, speed, efficiency metrics, Joe Mixon, Adrian Peterson, no Sean Moreno, really solid comps for him there. So that's kind of like what they were as prospects. I think overall production relatively similar. I might give a slight nod to ETN. Receiving, I would probably give a slight nod to Dobbins. Um, he was just kind of like more versatile, a little bit more dynamic there. Rushing, strong preference for ETN. Like Dobbins was a big play guy and that's about it. ETN was the full package. He's just clearly the better runner. He's one of the most efficient, most dynamic runners, most full package runners really that we've seen come out of college football in the last 15 years. He was just a very good college runner. And I think we also kind of think, you know, ETN could have been part of that 2020 running back class with like Jonathan Taylor, JK Dobbins, Cam Akers. He could have been part of that, but he surprised a lot of people by going back to school. And so I think he kind of got this rap as like, oh, he's going to be an old Old prospect now. Like he was in the same class as, as four-year guy Najee Harris. We know Najee Harris is a is an older prospect. I think ETN kind of got placed into that same like categorization as an older running back prospect. And I guess relatively he was, but he's still younger than J.K. Dobbins is. Travis ETN just turned 23 in January. Dobbins turned 23 in mid-December. So they're about a month and a half apart in age, but Dobbins doesn't get the old rap. He just missed a season due to injury. Travis ETN just missed a season due to injury. They're the same age. We should view them as like at equivalent places on the age curve. So given that they're the same age, given that ETN was probably a slightly better prospect, the question we now have to ask ourselves is, has J.K. Dobbins shown anything in the NFL that should have caused us to change our evaluation of him in relation to ETN? So since joining the Ravens, Dobbins, as a 21-year-old rookie, posted an 18% dominator rating, which is in the 65th percentile for 21-year-old players. Obviously, in his second year, he tore his ACL, I believe just in the preseason, um, and missed the whole season. So, we got the rookie season to go off of. In that rookie season, he was more efficient than the other guys on the team. He averaged 1.14 yards per carry greater than other Ravens running backs while seeing essentially the same box counts that the other guys on the team saw. And he posted a box adjusted efficiency rating of 123.9%, which is in the 80th percentile among all NFL running backs in the last five years. But his relative success rate, so how consistent is he on a per touch basis, was 1.1% lower than his teammates in the 46 sixth percentile among NFL running backs. And his breakaway conversion rate, which again, like how often is he turning 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs, just kind of like isolating performance to the open field, 
he converted those at a 40% clip, which is a 90th percentile mark among NFL running backs. And so kind of those numbers paint the picture of a guy who isn't super consistent, like on a play-to-play, down-to-down basis. He's not churning out like consistent yardage, gaining a requisite amount of yards, like down in and down out, but he's creating big plays. And because of that, his overall efficiency is pretty good. And I think those kind of like, obviously he had a he had a negative box adjusted efficiency rating in college, was barely more consistent than his teammates, but not to an impressive level at Ohio State, and was also good in the open field at Ohio State. And so I think these efficiency numbers, while a little bit different than those, make sense in the context of what he was doing in college. At Ohio State, he was good in the open field, not incredibly consistent. And here, in Baltimore, he's operating in an offensive system that is like conducive to big plays where like, Running lanes are being opened by linebackers paying attention to Lamar Jackson. And so we got these wide rushing lanes. He's able to get into the secondary where he is really good, you know, at the second level of defenses and make things happen there. And so his overall efficiency is good, despite not being maybe like an inherently like super instinctive runner in some way, like great vision, you know, whatever those things are that make him not as consistent of a player still exist. He's just able to be successful in the context of this offense because it accentuates the things he does well. So he's in a good situation as far as that goes. As a receiver, where I think, you know, given his college profile, I think his receiving was probably his strength as a prospect. He hasn't been used there to a tremendous degree so far. Um, As a rookie, he had a 6.9% target share. And given the size of his role in the offense overall, like that's just kind of average. To kind of give you a sense, like a point of comparison be like Jay Ajayi. So J.K. Dobbins' career dominator rating at this point is 18%. Jay Ajayi, through his age 25 season, had a 17% career dominator rating. Their target shares were within a percentage of each other as well. Dobbins at 6.9, Jay Ajayi at 6.1. And so proportionally, that's kind of the role he's had. He's been about as involved in the offense as Jay Ajayi was as a young player. He's been about as involved in the passing game as Jay Ajayi was as a young player. So just for some context, like that's the kind of role he's had in the NFL so far, like a Jay Ajayi type role. And I think that, you know, the way we think about Lamar Jackson and how he affects like the overall game plan for the Ravens, I think that makes some sense. Like J.K. Dobbins is a good receiver, at least as a rookie. He wasn't being thrown the ball that often. You know, Lamar Jackson is tucking it down and running it. The running backs in Baltimore just haven't been that involved in the passing game. So then the question sort of is like, is that performance a 7% target share, a high efficiency, low consistency performance on the ground, a, what was it? A a 65th percentile dominator rating as a 21-year-old player, is that enough of a quality performance that we should now view Dobbins as being a greater player than Travis Etienne? Etienne obviously hasn't shown anything in the NFL. He has some injuries of his own that he's dealt with. Is Dobbins in a vacuum a better player than Travis Etienne now? I don't believe so. I I don't think he did anything as a first-year NFL player that was like, whoa, we didn't see that in college. He's obviously, like, better than we thought he was. ETN hasn't shown anything to suggest that he's worse than we thought he was, other than, like, whatever his injury recovery looks like. Dobbins also just tore an ACL. Like, I don't see anything here that should that should have made us change our minds if we thought ETN was better than Dobbins coming out. And I think, like at least I did, and I think that was general consensus. But let's talk about ETN's injury. He, in the preseason, suffered a Liz Frank injury, which is like a fracture in the middle part of his foot. And I know there's a lot of talk about like, this is a serious injury. He obviously missed the entire season, so it wasn't like a small deal. What does his recovery look like? I've seen some interviews online from like, I believe February, where he said he's about 80 to 85% right now. You know, he's been squatting and running and things like that. So it seems like he's on track. I know Trent Baalke is an idiot as far as like team building goes, but Trent Baalke just said in a recent interview that ETN is ahead of his rehab schedule. So we've heard encouraging things out of Jacksonville from Travis ETN himself about where he is in his injury recovery. And I did a little bit of research into Liz Frank injuries. Like I'm not a fucking doctor, obviously, but I didn't know what it was. So I looked it up and found... I believe this is an article about Taysom Hill back uh, when he suffered a Liz Frank injury at BYU. But it says, According to researchers at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, nearly 93% of NFL players who sustained midfoot injuries from 2000 to 2010 returned to play within 15 months of injury and with no statistically significant decrease in performance. So, ETN suffered this Liz Frank injury in August of 2021. 15 months from then would be what is that, August, September, October, would be November. 
He's ahead of schedule. He's at 85% right now. I think the general timetable was that he was going to be ready by the time the 2022 season started. And he seems to be on pace for that anyway. I think the, the general timetable for a Liz Frank injury, like you could you could come back without surgery and play on it relatively soon. With surgery, it's about a 12-month recovery as far as I can tell. And he seems to be on pace for that. Given that this part about no statistically significant decrease in performance, I feel like we should be fairly optimistic about ETN's like potential to return to the player he was before. So I personally am optimistic about that. And given what the Jacksonville offense looks like right now, like what should we expect Travis Etienne to do going forward? I think we can gain some insights on what, like based on what James Robinson did in Etienne's absence. James Robinson as the lead back just last season, 31% dominator rating, which is in the 92nd percentile for 23 year olds, uh, 9.2% target share on a 58% snap share and a 66.5% opportunity share. And he finishes the RB23 in PP PR points per game on a Jaguars team that was obviously incredibly dysfunctional, really bad. They went 3 and 14, had the 27th most yards in the league and were last in points scored. So, terrible team. He was an RB2 in points per game and there's obviously like a workhorse sized hole in this offense now that James Robinson himself suffered a late season Achilles injury and probably A isn't going to be ready by the time the season starts and B probably will be a little bit less effective when he does play. So, James Robinson is gone. The other guys under contract right now for the Jaguars are Raquel Armstead, who I think is an interesting guy, but he's just kind of a backup at this point, Carlos Hyde, who sucks, and Nathan Cottrell, I think that's how you say it, I don't know, and Makai Sargent, who are just dudes. And given that J-Rob is like a great player, is now hurt, ETN should be the guy, he was supposed to be the guy last year, we were a little bit worried about him, like, okay, he went to the Jaguars, not a good situation, James Robinson's there, just had an RB1 season. The James Robinson concern is gone. The Jaguars being a bad team concern should also be gone, given that it hasn't mattered for James Robinson. He was an RB2, RB1 level producer the year before, on the same terrible team. ETN is a better player than James Robinson. So, it should be the ETN show, and now we got a new head coach. It's no longer Urban Meyer. It's the competent Doug Peterson. And I think we can gain more insights about like what ETN's role might look like, given what Doug Peterson has done with his running backs in the past. And he's had, you know, with the Eagles and the Chiefs, he's had a lot of like shitty running backs like Josh Adams. LeGarrette Blunt's not shitty, but he's not like a full skill set guy. I'm sure Kendrick West was his lead running back for a year. But in the seasons in which he had like quality running backs who could like reasonably play on all three downs, like Jamal Charles, Miles Sanders, guys like that. In the seasons in which he had players like that, his lead back received an average opportunity share of 64%, which would, which would have been 15th in the league in 2021, right there in like the Devin Singletary, Nick Chubb, James Conner range. I think that's a reasonable expectation for Travis Etienne, 64% opportunity share. If the Jaguars don't improve at all from last season, if their offense remains exactly the same, we see no jump from Trevor Lawrence. Doug Peterson causes them to improve to zero degree. Christian Kirk, obviously people have been laughing at that uh, addition, but it's better than what they had last year. Christian Kirk, these new additions don't mean anything for their offense. If they're exactly the same team as they were the year before, and Travis Etienne has a 64% opportunity share on the exact same efficiency that James Robinson had last season, a 64% opportunity share would give him 206.6 PPR points over a 17-game season, good for an RB15 finish. That is his floor. RB15 is Travis Etienne's floor. He's a better player than James Robinson. We should expect him to be more efficient. James Robinson had a 4.8% yards per target in 2021. Travis Etienne is a much more dynamic receiver, a much more dynamic athlete, a much more dynamic runner. He should be more efficient both on the ground, through the air. He should command a larger target share than James Robinson did. He should be more efficient on the touches he does receive than James Robinson was. He's one of the most efficient college runners we've seen in the last 15 years. He's a quality pass catcher. He's dynamic out in space. He's an easy RB1 in 2022 at least. And as a young running back, why is he not being selected in the top three rounds of Dynasty Startups? He's going to be a second round startup pick a year from now. So just treat him like that now. You don't have to pull him up to that range. He's obviously a smash at his current ADP. He was right there neck and neck with like Najee Harris a year ago as far as like who's the better prospect. They went back to back in the NFL draft. Najee Harris went to a situation that we also thought was shitty. Ben Roethlisberger getting old. He obviously wasn't good last year. Everybody was worried about the offensive line. So there were like situational concerns about both of them. Age concerns about both of them. More severe age concerns for Najee Harris. And just because Harris like stayed healthy for a year, he was he was good. 
obviously, but like ETN is the same level of dude. Why should we not, like you shouldn't be taking him in the top five. Like people are taking Najee Harris in the top five. That's whatever. ETN, don't do that. Like the injury risk is what it is, but the upside at where he's being taken is just like, what is it? It's so, I don't even fucking know. It's ridiculous, man. ETN undervalued. How does that relate to Dobbins? Under contract currently for the Ravens. Gus Edwards, who also missed last season with the torn ACL. Hill, Justice Hill, he sucks. Tyson Williams, came on a little bit at the, at the in the early part of last season, lost his job to like Devontae Freeman and Le'Veon Bell. And Nate McCrary, who is a nobody. Edwards, I don't think is going away. I think the, I think the Ravens like him. I think D- Dobbins is better, but he's not going away. I think Dobbins is pretty well capped at like below 60% opportunity share. The Ravens threw the ball two running backs 62 times in 2020, only 83 times in 2021, and Devontae Freeman last year was their leading target guy at running back on a 44% snap share. J.K. Dobbins the year before had a 47% snap share and 24 targets. If we give him the Devontae Freeman role, give him a, I don't know, 50% snap share, even a 60% target share of running back targets, and let's say they throw the ball to running backs 90 times this season, more than they have in the past two years, that's like 54 targets for J.K. Dobbins. He just feels like... I think that's where he kind of like caps out. And as a runner, I think he's still going to share time with Gus Edwards, even if he has more carries. He just feels like given the role he's likely to have in the offense, given his talent profile, I think he's like dynamic, but fairly limited as a runner. He's in a situation where like his receiving abilities aren't going to be used to their full potential. He just feels like less of a centerpiece and more of just like a piece to the offense where ETN is a guy who's going to be a centerpiece of that team. Dobbins is a little bit Miles Sanders-ish. He's good, a little bit overrated. I think he was a little bit overrated as a prospect. I think we're headed to, with J.K. Dobbins, like yearly disappointment. We propped up Miles Sanders for like three straight years. I was like, oh, he's a first, second round startup pick. Like, take him at the turn. He's going to be a stud. J.K. Dobbins isn't quite up there, but like, I think we're headed to the same thing. We're like, why isn't this guy getting more touches? Like, he's efficient when he catches the ball. Like, but yeah, but that's kind of just what he is. He's that you know, he's good out in space. He's not the centerpiece of an offense. Per keep trade cut, J.K. Dobbins is currently valued higher than Austin Eckler, Dalvin Cook, Nick Chubb, Alvin Kamara, Antonio Gibson, and I would take every single one of those guys over him. I would also take Travis Etienne over him. Continue to smash Etienne in the fifth round. Pull him up ahead of J.K. Dobbins if you have to. He's going to be a second round startup pick next year. Win your leagues. Get Travis Etienne. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.